Good morning, everyone. I am Sarah with Harrisburg Project, and today we are going over the interpreter data collection that is brand new to ISTAR. Um, this will be collected once a year, so it's an annual collection. Um, we don't have very many things that are like this um, in our arena, so um, that will be something we're not quite used to, but we will adjust. Um, I do anticipate a lot of questions today, and that's perfectly fine. Um, I hope that I can provide a little bit of information that hasn't been in the documentation and things like that that may help you. Um, I have asked a lot of questions to ISB staff already on this, and so um, I'm hoping that a lot of things that I have the answers to will help you today. But if not, and there are questions that I cannot answer, um, rest assured I will find out. Um, if we need to have a Q&A after this posted, we'll do that. Um, if you have questions after the session, please let us know. Uh, give us a call, send us an email if you think of something later. Um, we would really like to get all of our questions asked to ISBE and try to make this a little bit smoother process for all of you. Um, it is something that, again, you'll be doing throughout the school year. We're just going to report it once a year. So. If you have not attended a session with us before, um, you can ask questions in the questions pod in your GoToWebinar menu. I don't mind questions throughout the session, but if I don't answer immediately, it may mean that I'm going to get to it or address it later um, as we go through the presentation. Um, but feel free to ask any questions you want to in that questions pod. Also, I uploaded your handout, so hopefully um, you've got that and you can take some notes today if you need to. We also record all of our webinars and within a day or two, those will be posted to our website so you can come back and listen to the recording if you need to. There is already a, re um, I'm sorry, a training out that is a demonstration on how to enter the data and things like that, but there's not a lot of explanation in that about the content. So hopefully we can clear some things up today, but again, I do anticipate to have some questions and unfortunately, um, some of them may be questions that I am not able to answer yet because this is brand new and I, I you know, I'm not the one doing the job every day. And so it's hard for me to anticipate what you might be asking. So um, I have asked some things, but I'm sure I haven't asked them all. So we will get to the bottom of it um, and try to make, again, this is a seamless and smooth uh, collection this year. So um, we will go ahead and get started. We have a really large group today, so I do anticipate some questions, but um, I don't expect it to take us too long to get through this material. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and remember, just put those questions in your questions pod in your GoToWebinar menu if you have them. So the interpreter data collection is going to be on June 30th this year. Um, so all of the interpreter and translator data will be collected after that. Um, it is, again, it's an annual um, aggregate collection. This is not a per student collection. You're not going to see anything about this being collected on the individual student record. So part, it has two parts and part two actually has two areas for it. So for part one, this is something that is on the IEP conference summary report. It has been being collected um, from what I can see since January of 2022. But this began, uh, discussions began regarding this in um, January of 2021. So as far as data entry, yes, it's something new. But as far as something that has been collected and tracked, it's not as new um, as some of us thought. So um, this is something that has been going on and being collected. And so I will show you where it's collected on the conference summary, at least on the um, ISB form. And, you know, some of those are different and, and your um, programs may have different layouts or something like that if you use an IEP program. But regardless, it has been being collected. So um, it would be nothing new as far as something going on during meetings. For part two, this is going to be for translations that are provided. And so there are two areas to that and we will go over those. Um, these are gonna be for translations for conference recommendations and then 10, at a minimum, 10 of the vital IEP forms. And so I'll try to let you know what all of those things are in the most common languages as well in the, in the state as we go throughout the session. So 
when you are in ISTAR, where do you go to report the data? So it's going to be one of those rectangles at the bottom of your landing page. So as soon as you click in I was onto ISTAR and it opens up the ISTAR application, you are basically on the home tab, which we call the landing page. And so down at the bottom, you'll see several different rectangles. Some of them tell you how many error messages you have. Um, it does depend on your uh, security role in ISTAR as to what you will see at the bottom, but there are no roles set for interpreter collection. So all users should be able to see this box. And so what you would do as you're coming toward the end of the year and you know you're done with meetings and you're ready to report your data, you would click on this button and then you would fill out the form. So um, the interesting thing about this is it is per school. So it's not for the district as a whole, it's per school in, within the district. Okay, so remember to keep that in mind. We don't have a lot of things that we collect, at least in ISTAR at a school level. So this is something that's kind of new for us as well. So the first thing to talk about is what if you don't have any interpreters or translators requested or, or provided? Um, then you know, you're not going to be providing any numbers because they would all be zeros. So instead of doing that, if you know at the end of the year that you did not have this occur for any of your meetings, then once you click on the interpreter collection box, you're gonna come right here and you're just gonna say that they were not requested in your district. So you check that box and hit confirm. And then it will automatically create entries for all of your schools in your district or districts and it will tell you you know that it will say that there you know there's no data for them okay all right so again we've talked about it's an annual anonymously aggregated report so almost everything in ISTAR that you report to ISB is on a student level so this is not something where you're going to open up the student approval record and see a new field that says requested interpreter had translation. That's not where it's going to be collected, okay? It will solely be collected underneath that module that you see when you click on that rectangle box on your landing page. So it's not going to be seen anywhere else in the system. So it is not a per student collection. This is not going to necessarily add to your daily data entry um, process. So what you wanna do whenever you are ready to enter data is to select a resident district. The school year will default, and then you can go ahead and select a language, although it's gonna ask you to do it again. Then you will click add. And once that record starts, it's gonna be per school inside the district that you selected, and then you will select the language that you are reporting for. Remember, it's an annual report. So if you have West Side School and you need to report data for Spanish, it all needs to be in this single entry. You're not gonna have multiple times that you come in and say, West Side School Spanish, West Side School Spanish, and have multiple entries. So each line in your results grid, once you enter data, will be per school. You should not see the school more than once. And the system won't let you do that, but I'm just making it clear but this is not something that you're gonna come in and repeatedly enter for these two same data elements, okay? So I do have, um, and you do, yes, it's an entry per language. So that's a question I have, it is per language. So the entry we're gonna work on right now as our example in this session is gonna be at Harrisburg High School for Spanish, okay? So you may have your schools listed several times per language, but you will not have your schools listed several times for a single language. So this one entry for Harrisburg High School for Spanish is going to be all on one single form, okay? One record. All right, so will there be a report created for this? Um, we are going to, I'm in the process of creating a tracking form. Um, that you can use. So it will be where you can come in. It's nothing fancy, I'll be honest with you. Um, it's hard for me to even calculate some of the um, percentages for you because I don't know how many entries you're going to have, but I am trying to create a spreadsheet that you can use to go plug in 
the meeting date, the sys ID, and was an interpreter, um, you know, was an interpreter asked for the, the questions that you have to answer. So I've got those in columns where you could come in and do that on a per student basis and then tally all those at the end of the year and put them in. So we have it for interpreter and then I have like a tab for translators part one and translators part two. So we are in the process of working on that. Um, so yes, you have to fill out a response for every language for every school if it was requested. So it's not going to be that you would come in and say Harrisburg High School in Spanish, but we didn't have any. OK, that's not the way it's going to be. So you're only going to report data for the languages that you provided per school. So say that in high school you provided a Spanish interpreter one time, but your other schools did not. Your other schools will come in on separate entries. They will have zeros. Spanish will come in for the high school. OK. So it's only what you do. So, okay. So for for example, for Harrisburg High School, if you um, did Spanish, provided Spanish interpreters, um, Arabic interpreters, then you would have two entries for Harrisburg High School, one for Spanish, one for Arabic. Okay. Um, would this work the same for an interpreter for a child who is partially deaf? Yes. So this includes sign language. Um, so for um, your outplacements, so if you have kids that go to private facilities, their resident school is still going to be a school in your district. So if they go to a private facility, but they should be at Harrisburg High School if they weren't at that facility or if they weren't receiving services. So if they were, you know, in a perfect world, they would normally be at Harrisburg High School, then that is the where what you would report it under. So we're not looking at serving school here. If you're responsible for them and they should be in one of your resident schools, then that's the school that you will use to report for them. So yes, if you had Spanish, but another language at the high school, then yes, you're going to have multiple entries per school if you have more than one language that is used. So, um, so again, another question about therapeutic day schools. So they're still your responsibility. So the resident, dis resident school, if it's one of your schools, even if they're outplaced, you still would report on their behalf if they have had an interpreter or translator. Okay, so again, there's another question about private schools. That's the same answer. If they go to a private school, it's the same thing. Okay, so the interpreters. Um, so the interpreter, so yes, if it's a parent, yes. That, so that's usually the interpreter is for the parent, sometimes the child. It just depends. But if you have to request one at all, then you're going to report it. So the kids may speak fluent English. They may be, you know, bilingual. But when the parents come in, do they need an interpreter? But really they want, anytime you need an interpreter, um, they want you to report it. So for this school year, you're going to be looking when the kids have meetings, if they need an interpreter and that paperwork comes across your desk like it normally would for updates to data, then you're going to look to see on the IEP, did they have um, an interpreter? And if they did, then that is when you would go to this report and put in you know, the info about them. So it's not that you have to go back through IEPs, but moving forward, you're going to have to have a report, you know, keep, keep track of that data per student that comes in.
This is for IEP students. So it's not for service plan students. Okay, so again, it's per school. I see some questions about per school. It is per school. If you are serving parochial school students and they have an IEP, then you're responsible for this. Um, So it is the same for sign language. So if you have a child that is not going to be at the meeting and the parents don't need the sign language, then I would assume that you didn't request it. But if you, you know, I mean, if you went through the process to request that an interpreter be there, then you would track that that would count. So it's just going to depend on if you needed them or not, whether they showed up or not. This is typically, I'm not going to say that this wouldn't be for the student, but typically what we're talking about here is gonna be the interpreter for the parent. So again, if the child is bilingual, that's usually not the issue. It's going to be that um, the na their native language is not English. So yes, you would start collecting this data now for this school year. So really, you're going to have to go back possibly into August if you know you had translators that you missed. Um, Okay, so private schools, when we talk about private facilities, we're talking about public kids with IEPs that go to a therapeutic day school. This is gonna be required for them. If you have students that go to parochial schools, if, they're, if they still have an IEP, which means they're duly enrolled, then you're going to be reporting this data for them as well. If you have kids that go to parochial schools or homeschooled with a service plan, we're not collecting for those. Not all parochial school students have a service plan. Just because they do in your district doesn't mean that all of them do. So we have three different fund codes for those kids. And the fund code L and P are the, probably the most common ones where they're not enrolled and they have a service plan. But there's a fund K also. That means they're duly enrolled in parochial or homeschool for regular ed, but they're still enrolled in the public district and they still have an IEP. So those are fund code K kids and you would have to do that for fund code K kids. Okay. Yes, it's per meeting throughout the school year. So if they have multiple meetings and you have to request a translator each time or an interpreter, then yes. And you might possibly have to work through paperwork that you look through paperwork that you've already processed. There's a possibility of that. It depends on if it's a common thing for you to have interpreters or translators or not. Okay. So as far as the translations go, for the top 10 languages, it's 10 languages. So you're required for the top 10 languages, okay? So those are gonna be, um, I actually, I it's not in the documentation, so I looked these up because it's there's a link in the documentation that tells you where to find it um, on the internet. So it's in the English Learners Statistical Report so Spanish is number one, and then it's Arabic, Polish, Urdu, Russian, uh, Jujarati, Filipino, French, Mandarin, and uh, Vietnamese. So those are the top 10 languages 
Um, and even if it's not on this list as a top 10, it's still recommended that you try to get the interpreter or the translator. So it's not just saying, okay, if it's not in the top 10, forget about it. Okay, so I mean, not necessarily hard and fast rule there, but it's in your best interest to try to accommodate them, even if it's not one of the top 10 languages. Okay. All right, so pro back on parochial kids, if they have a service plan, um, it just says it's for IEPs and the guidance, okay? But if they are duly enrolled and for some reason they're really a resident of another district, you're still responsible for that as, um, this, as that serving location. So th the only time that the resident school and the, or the resident district and the resident school are not going to be where the child resides is if they come to a parochial school in someone else's jurisdiction. So if you have a parochial school in your jurisdiction, you're responsible for all those kids that go to that parochial school, whether they're from Harrisburg or um, Chicago. If, you, if they're in your jurisdiction going to your parochial school and they're special ed, you are actually their resident district in ISTAR. So if they have an IEP, then you're gonna be responsible for them. Um, so this started the beginning of this school year. So it's the whole 23-24 school year. Um, in ISTAR, we're only doing this for IEPs. I did see some mention of 504 in the guidance, um, but again, we don't deal with 504s, and so I'm not positive that they are actually doing it for everything. So, all right. So um, for your early childhood screenings, if you're having a meeting, then and you have to request interpreters then that's going to go into your counts um so it started again in the, the beginning of this school year so if you started in august um then that's when it would be again you know a lot of things i know we talk about this is just for initials this is just for revals or something like that this is going to be for all of your meetings for the kids um All right, so if you have a student that has a deficit, but they're not gonna be at the meeting and no one's requested an interpreter because it's not necessary, then I would not count that one. Um, I'll have a lot of questions about when did this start? So I think I've covered that. When does it start? Um, if you had non-English speaking parents, then you probably had a translator or I mean a translation of the documents sent to them. Okay, so no matter what, this is by resident school. So even if you have kids that are out placed somewhere else, you're still going to reporting, be reporting this for them under the resident school. Um, this is translated documents to parents. So. Most of this revolves around interpreters and transla translators for the parent. That's gonna be the most common thing. From what I have, so this is asking, is this for IEP meetings only? From what I have asked ISBE, it's just if ever. If you have to get an interpreter or a translator, or not translator, if you have to have translations or an interpreter anytime during the year, then it will count. Um, hmm. This will take effect August 1 through July 31st. That's the school year. If, and so about pre-K screenings, it's any type of meetings that you have, okay?
even if the child does not end up with an IEP, you can still report it. So if you do a meeting and they're not eligible, we still need to know. Yes, for sign language, if it's one of the services, the phone service, then that counts, yes. And for each school, if you did not have to have interpreters, then you're gonna have to report per school. You can select the district. So if you select the district and you don't have any in the whole district, then you don't have to do it per school. But if you're going to have an entry for one school and not for the three others, then it's going to be the process where you add a record and report zeros. OK, so let's get into the notes a little bit more. Um, all right. So to add in per school, you're going to click the add button. And then what you're going to see is your grid for the collection. So the first thing you're going to provide is the language. You're going to provide the number of requests for interpreters than the number that the district granted. But for number four and five, this is going to be the number of parent requests for an IEP interpretation only, and the number of requests granted for that. So what does that mean? That means that if you have an interpreter come to the meeting, that they are only acting as an interpreter. So in other words, they aren't going to be also filling the role of a related service provider. So they're not gonna be the interpreter and the psychologist or the social worker that's at the meeting, okay? So if they don't request for them to not fulfill another role, if, there's, if that's a moot point, then this would be a zero for that entry. So if you have people who, um, you know, you had interpreters requested, you've gone through the meeting, they've been granted, even if they didn't request them, you know, technically, but if you had an interpreter there, then it's gonna go in the number of requests. So if an interpreter showed up, put them in the number of requests, then you're gonna have the number granted. And the goal is to basically, you know, you want to have these match. If they've asked for one, then you wanna be able to say that you granted one. But then these last two questions are going to be essentially, did that person who provided the interpretation do anything else, play any other role in the meeting? So if they did not, for that school, you'll have zero and zero for four and five, okay? So it's did they participate or have any other role in the IEP meeting beyond just being the, trans or the interpreter, okay? And this is an aggregate report. It's not per student. You're going to have to look at your IEPs, but when you put it in ISTAR, it's all going to be smashed together. You're going to report the aggregate data. Okay, so this is what the form looks like. So per school, you would be doing this for interpreters. So you can see what we just went over, the number that you had, so the number requested, the number provided, if you needed an interpreter anyway at all, you're gonna put it in this first box. Hopefully you fulfilled all those. So then you would report the number that were fulfilled. And then we're gonna say in our example that we had one instance where the parent did actually request that even though the interpreter might have been able to, to fulfill another role, they requested that they not do that. So maybe they wanted to have a different psychologist or something like that. But regardless, they did not participate in any other way but as an interpreter. Okay. So where is the part one data? This is the piece that actually has been collected on the conference summary. Again, what I can see starting in January of 2022, so over for about 18 months. So it's in the middle, it's under interpreter services, and I've laid out here what you should be looking at on these to add together to fulfill 1-1, Okay, so those are, should be able to give you those answers that you're looking for. Okay, 
The second piece is for translations that are given to the parents of the IEP. So again, it's annually reported. It's all on the same form. The first one will be the number of translations requested, basically in any way or shape, any way, shape or form. If you translated documents, then this will count. Okay, so that would be a, a one if um, you did that for the parent. Next will be um, the number of translated forms that were actually provided. So you're gonna have your request and the ones that you provided. And then number three will be the translated form, the number that were provided at the time of the IEP meeting. So you're gonna report, you know, we had three meetings last week and all three times the translated documents were provided right at that time, okay? But for number four, you're gonna look at the meetings that you did where they were not provided at the time, but rather there were days in between those. And so for all the students that had days, delays basically, and not given at the meeting date, then you're going to be tracking the number of days. And so what you would do is at the end of the year, you would take the total number of days and divide by the meetings. So the total, total, um, the total meetings that you held where you did do translations. And so that would give you the average number of days. Okay. All right, so what this is going to look like in ISTAR is going to be this. So the first one is how many translations um, were completed, or I'm sorry, requested. We have three here and we provided three. So that's great, we're at 100%. So we're gonna see, see down at the bottom that I'm saying here that none of these were provided at the time of the meeting and that my average school days to provide the translations was eight. So where did I get the eight? So what you would do is take your students and you would have, you, we've got three here. So we're gonna say one took five days, number two took eight days, number three took 11 days. And so we would add up each student's days. So you may have a list this long in your Excel spreadsheet of the days. So we would want to add all of those up and then divide by the total number of students. Okay, I think I misspoke earlier and said meetings, but really it should be the same. But the total number of students. So you had three students, we added up their days that it took, divided by the number of students and got our average of eight days. So we're saying on average, it took eight days to get these translations to the parents, okay? So part 2B, and, and that piece was for the conference recommendations, okay? So one, so part 2A is for the con conference recommendation translations. Now, this next part is going to be for any of the documents that are on the vital documents list, but it's not limited to these. So this is going to include the IEP, um, the parents uh, guardian notification of conference, notifi notification of conference recommendations, your procedural safeguards, um, consent for initial evaluation, parent consent for re-eval, evaluation reports, eligibility determination, manifestation determination, review, IEP progress reports, or Medicaid consent forms. So if any of these have translations given to the parents, then that is when we're going to be um, reporting these. So. For part 2B, again, we're doing it by language, the number of requests, the numbers granted, and again, these are for the vital documents, the number of uh, parent requests for IEP translation only, and the number granted. So if they only wanted the IEP translated, then that's what we're going to report. And so it looks very similar to part 2A to where we're putting in the number of requests um, for a translation, 
Um, the number provided, of course, we want that at 100 percent. And then the number of percent provided within 30 school days of the IEP. So we have um, we have none of those. And then the average school days to provide the translations. And so we've added all these together. And again, it's very similar to our last example where we're going to add up the number of days, divide by the total number of students. OK, so the entry is pretty straightforward. It's going to come down to how are you going to track this throughout the school year? So you just want to make sure that you are tracking it somehow. Again, if you're going to wait on this um, spreadsheet that we're going to try to provide, that's great. If you want to start your own, you can do that as well. So if you come in um, at the end of the year and you report all this data and you know that you're done, then you can click I am done reporting. Now, if you have um, a resident district that has four schools. Two of the schools are going to have data for the collection, but two of the schools are not. That's when you're going to have to come in and do a resident school for the two that are that did not have any data. You're still going to have to add a record for them, leave it blank, and say, I am done reporting. And then that way, ISDE will know that you've reported for all four schools, that two schools had data and two schools did not. So remember, it's per school. So we can get it down to resident districts. So if the whole district did not have any interpreters or translations, then that's fine. You'll use the checkbox we looked at at the beginning. But if you have um, you know, a mix of some schools that have data and some that don't, then you're going to have to do the I am done reporting and have a, have a record for each school and go through that process. OK? All right, I'm going to try to start going back through these questions. Um, I hope that I've answered some of yours today. And if there are some I can't answer, then I will have a um, Q&A. Okay, I see a question about if you didn't have any interpreters per school. So I think I kind of covered that, but if, if it's per, for a whole resident district, then you'll just do that one time at the beginning at the one of the first couple slides we looked at. So if it's for the whole district, you only have to you know make one check. But if it's gonna be um, you know a variation inside the resident district on schools, then you're gonna have to do it per school, even if some of them did not have. Um, this is per language the total year. Um, it's, this is, will we, this be based on interpreter requested or provided? I mean, it's both. I mean, I think you can see through the questions. It's, it's going to ask you both things. Uh, We have all of the languages. Um, so at our school, we have over 400 languages that are spoken. Are you going to have that many in the pull down list? So it's going to have all of, it, it's going to have all of the approved languages in the state. It's not going to have things that are. Um, and I saw in the guidance, like it's not going. We don't acknowledge, you know. Um, necessarily preferred language all the time, so you're not going to see like. Um, I think Dothraki was one of the examples. Um, so if you're a Game of Thrones person, um, but I'm trying to find here. It had some examples of what you're not going to find. And I might not have brought that with me down here. Um, yeah, I don't think I brought it down here with me, but this guidance document, um, this link here at the end, it's going to have um, all the information, basically these papers that I kind of brought with me because I'm not comfortable just yet with this because it's new for me too. So it's going to have all that kind of information in it. But yes, it's going to have a lot of, of languages in the drop down. Um, 
Um, this is not going to go toward any funding or reimbursement. This is a quali This is a new collection um, that is been in put into the approval um, instructions, and this stemmed from a lawsuit. So um, it's something that we don't have a choice but to start collecting. And we have a lot of things like that that are not tied to funding that you collect for. So this is just going to be another one of those things. So it's just more data. Um, let's see. We have a lot of questions. So um, Okay, so I have a question about keeping your records and your documents for audit purposes. That's going to be whatever your bookkeeper tells you. So for whatever, however long you have to list it, um, or how long you have to keep your financial documents and those things, it's the same thing for this data. Um, the vital documents listing is going to be on page 12 at the bottom. There's a link in this document that ISB has put out. Um, if the language is requested not but not listed, do we still count it? As long as it's a legitimate language. So if it's something legitimate, then yes. Um, if you do, if you have two meetings in one day, then I would count that per meeting, not per day. Um, so will we still add the language if it's not in the top 10 languages? Well, the documentation, I mean, it, it kind of clearly states that just because it's not one of the top 10 languages doesn't mean you don't make an effort to provide it. So if you do provide it for a language that is not in the top 10, then you know, you wouldn't put that you, then you know, that you did that. But, you, I mean, districts, I think, make an effort for languages outside of the top 10. So, again, I have, I have a lot of references to the top 10 languages. This isn't necessarily a requirement that you only report on the top 10, but you have to report on the top 10. Okay, to locate the interpreter collection, it's just gonna be as soon as you log into ISTAR, you're gonna see the rectangle down at the bottom. And the start date for this would have been the 23-24 school year, which started August 1st. Yes, you include early childhood. Only the interpreter data would be on the IEP, the translation, the translated documents. I mean, it's not recorded anywhere in the IEP, so that's why it'll be your responsibility. Um, if you have a, terp a student that has an interpreter at all times, how do we record that? Um, You would need to know if the, if the interpreter is for the parent. It's do you? It's if you have an interpreter for the parent at the meeting requested. Um, this would, as far as I know, this is just for relation to IEP meetings. So reevals, annuals, IEP meetings. Um, Sign language, I think, is under English sign language in the drop down if you can't find it. This is not for a school function. This would just be for meetings from what I can tell. If they use a translating device, yes, that is included. All the all of the languages are listed in the drop down, not just the top 10. This is not for daily interpreter services for the student. This is going to be for meetings. It mostly is revolving around parents. This is, again, just an IEP related meeting. 
you will have to count the paperwork that has been translated, whether it was just the recommendations or other forms. Um, the training for to be a qualified interpreter has not been posted yet. I did ask again yesterday. Um, so you are to report those interpreters as though they were qualified, um, even though that training is not available yet. Um, I think I answered about the no other role. If a draft was provided at the meeting, that's not going to be the final document. So that would not count as the day of. And yes, your goal should be to the best of your ability to give translated documentation and forms to the parent the day of the meeting. Yes, that's the goal, but that's not always feasible. Um, so if all translated conference forms were provided at the time of the meeting, would the average school days be zero? Yes, mm -hmm. it would. That's a great way to put it. Um, I mean, this is going to be something that you're going to have to work together with people who are doing the meetings and say, hey, we need to know this data now. We have to collect it. We have to report it. So, you know, if they give paperwork, send paperwork home that night, that's going to be a zero day. You know, so if if they're sending it home, then there's not going to be a day, to, you know, a day between two to report. So. Um, I got the list of uh, vital IEP documents in this list here. It's on um, page 12, second paragraph. Part 2A and 2B, I think I did misspeak, but it's divided by the total number of students, not, I mean, not the total meetings you held in the whole year. So for a school that doesn't have any, um, you will, if it's all of the schools in a resident district, you can complete the first step that I showed early in the presentation. If it's a, a, a mix, so some, maybe th two of your schools had provided something, but two of your schools did not, then you're gonna to have to do four entries. And on the two that did not provide interpreters or translations, you'll have to do the I am done reporting and save it with zeros with your fields blank. Um. I have a question, when will the data sheet be ready from ISBE since we have to collect it now? So I'm working on the data sheet, ISBE's not providing it, um, and I do have a pretty good rough draft right now. So once we get that um, finalized, we'll have it posted to our website. Uh, I just have some duplicate questions, so. So again, for 2A and 2B, the specifics of what they're asking you are gonna be on page 12 of this document, okay?
Okay, so the data is actually due on June 30th. Right now, if the interpreter is a family member, you can count that. If an IEP is provided in Spanish, then yes, that's considered a translation. Anything that's not English is a translation. This session is being recorded. It'll probably post um, late tomorrow or Monday. Um, I think if you accidentally hit the I am done reporting button um, that you can open it back up and edit, edit that. If not, you may have to let us know. Um, and we may have to have ISBE intervene. Of course, we don't know yet. <laughs> exactly how it's all going to operate because we have only had us testing it and um you know we can we can do our best to test something but it's difficult when you're not actually in the field doing that so um have a question about um uploading the data um you know from another source i don't there is not a mechanism to do that right now typically we have that with chicago public schools but they have to collect and report what the other districts do, but they have more they have to collect. So their upload is not going to work for everyone else this time. So um, I'm, right now there is not one, but if you are highly interested in that, then I can send that on to ISBIT. So if you want to want to send an email to us about it, I can send that on to IT and ask them if there's a possibility. Um, Let's see. I have one question that I'm still sitting on, and I think I'm not going to answer it, but because I, I just don't know. But the one, um, the one where the entire meeting was in Spanish because <clears throat> the providers and the families all spoke Spanish. So I, I think. I think that that is a no, but I, I think I need to take that one back and ask about it for sure. Okay, so, all right. Um, all right, so first of all, this documentation has been out since May of 2023. So this was not brand new in August. I mean, if you didn't hear about it, that's one thing. But, um, you know, it this has been talked about um, in a lot of conferences, in a lot of meetings. I know that um, people that are doing the IEPs have been collecting this data for the interpret interpreters for sure. The translations have been occurring. Um, I mean, I understand there's a little bit of frustration with a new data element, but this is this is kind of just how it goes. I mean. We've actually been pretty fortunate that we haven't had any new data elements in a long time. Um, so this is going to fall along the lines of state performance plan indicators where, yeah, you don't you don't really see a lot out of them. Um, but, um, you know, it's not going to a claim or reimbursement, but it's a part of your everyday data collection. And I mean, it's just it's just, you know, it's part of the collection now. So. Um, the data collection paperwork that I am providing um, is just an idea that I had. So this is not an official ISBE document. Um, it will be, you know, something that you can choose to use, and it's just something that we're providing to help out. Um, but it is not official documentation or anything like that. And so um, we've been waiting for, you know, all the guidance to come out in our approval manual, but um, this has kind of been known about for, for a while. So this went into statute in um, January of 2021. So 
um, I get it, you know, you don't want to, um, you know, it's new information and those kinds of things, but um, it's just, it's just a new collection. So, um, let's see here. Uh, so for, okay, I have had this question a lot, I'm glad. So if you're a co-op district, if you have that type of a relationship, I mean, we're not gonna dictate who's responsible for the data and who's gonna put it in. That's the relationship that you guys hold already. So it doesn't mean that this isn't something that you're not gonna charge your school districts with doing. They can come in and report the data themselves in ISTAR. So all the district superintendents have automatic access, full access to the ISTAR system. So if you want, if this, this needs to be on the schools to do this, the, you know, the actual districts, then so be it. If it's something that, you know, you've agreed, um, you know, if your directors agreed with the administrators that it's something you're going to do, then they're going to have to provide the data for you. It's also going to depend, depend on who, who provides the IEPs, where are the IEPs, those kinds of things. So um, it's going to be something that you guys will have to come up with um, you know, as, as a district co-op relationship. So, okay. So I am going to work to have a Q and A out for you guys. I am going to take the one question I was unable to answer back. Also, if I missed any questions, this gets very, this jumps around um, and gets complicated. So if you have any questions at all um, that I miss in the Q and A, please reach out to me and let me know. But if I miss anything in the session today, I'll find it in my um, report after the fact. So, um, <laughs> I know, I guess she's, uh, okay, so it says you're not upset with me. I know you're not upset with me. Um, I know your frustrations, but again, I, I really, we've been really lucky for a while. We have not had any big new data elements, and so I, I think we're not used to that anymore, but Regardless, I know you're not upset with us and we'll do everything we can to get you through it. Um, and I'm gonna try to get that report approved um, or that collection approved so that you know you guys have something else, at least for the translations to collect. Um, but I do think if you're not collecting the interpreter data on your conference summaries, you probably need to talk to somebody about that because I'm pretty sure that's something that is a requirement. So you wanna make sure, and don't quote me on that, but I, I believe from what I have read that it's supposed to be there. So. Um, but the translations, that's a tough one. It's not being collected anywhere. So we're going to try to help you with that, even though I know you're going to have to go back and look at some data. Um, but we will, we will get through it and move on. Um, so if you have any questions after the session, um, please let me know. I'm happy to help. Um, we're all happy to help in any way that we can. And um, I know we'll have a lot more questions, but we're going to keep working closely with ISBE to try to get all those answered. So I will see all of you at the next session. Um, and it won't be as interesting probably, but I will see you next time and have a great day, guys. And thanks for attending. Bye-bye.